Uh, I think this session will probably take a little bit less than an hour, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, and what I thought we could do is I'll do a very brief sort of presentation of the context. Um, but then I think more interestingly, talk about some of the content that's, un that's underlying the program. And then we'll have a quick dip into the platform and we'll just have a wander around uh, just so that we're all comfortable with how the platform works. And uh, if, we, if we need some time at the end for Q&A, then we'll do that uh, as well. So I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. And this is the first moment of truth. And what you should be seeing now is a, uh, a slide that says the new world of work. Now, I always just start with this briefly because when Tal and I first met some 10 years ago, this was really the observation that was driving us, that the world of work in every organization is in the process of changing. Different, maybe at different paces, but fundamentally, uh, you know, the, the reliable, organized, ordered world that we had in the past that provided us with stable structures has left us. Uh, because there's so much rapid change and uncertainty and, and volatility that we now find ourselves more uh, on the right side of this page. And there are huge implications to this in terms of how each of us operates. So fundamentally, there's an increasing return to being at the top of your game, or if you like, an increasing return to flourishing compared to how things were before. And this is why organizations are simply clamoring for individuals that seem to be on fire at the top of their game. And this is pretty much what the Potential Life program is all about. So it's all very well just stating that as a sort of grounding thought. The question is, you know, what does one do about this? And I think, you know, sometimes it's useful to have a visual metaphor. So I'm just going to skip through a couple of slides and talk about one way of describing this visually. And one way to think about this is that, you know, each of us, when we get up in the morning, every day has a choice. Uh, and this is a visual metaphor, but we have a choice to turn right or to turn left. Um, the turning right version of us is, is the better version. It's the purposeful, it's the energetic, it's the collaborative, uh, positive version. Uh, and the turning left is perhaps the, uh, the drained, perhaps the just going through the motions, uh, perhaps the passive or actively aggressive version. Um, and the point is not, who are you? That's not the relevant question. Uh, the relevant question is, how can we consistently be choosing to turn right? And, and this framing is important because it raises two sub-questions. And we're going to talk about each of those sub-questions. And fundamentally, the Potential Life program is created around those two sub-questions. First question is, what is is the definition of the right. It's all very well to be using lay language, which I tend to use, like being at the top of your game or, or flourishing or, or having fire in your belly. But what do we really scientifically mean by what's on the right side of this page? So that's the first important question. Then the second question is, once you see what it is, how does one turn right consistently? So what's the method? Um, so we'll talk about um, both of those and then we'll uh, get stuck in and have a look at the program. So what do we mean by turning right? Well, you're familiar with the SHARP framework. Now, just as a word of intro, uh, when Tal and I met 10 years ago, we spent a year getting this articulation right. Uh, and in a way, it's, it's bringing together two very different brains. Now, Tal is the, the scientific uh, researcher brain, uh, vast encyclopedic, with a vast amount of knowledge. Uh, and I'm the, the sort of layman, the simplifier brain, uh, that was trying to make an articulation that we could all understand and use. Uh, and we wanted to get this right so that it's both accessible, but of course, uh, representing the science, explaining most of the variants. So I'll just spend a, a second on this because I do think it's, it's valuable to sort of bring to life what's in the SHARP framework in, in, in summary. Um, strengths, what's this all about? Fundamentally, it's because we've been conditioned, uh, starting at, in school, usually, to think that the way to progress in life is to fix the bits that are not working. And there are so many parts of our life that reinforce this view. Now, we're not saying that we shouldn't do that. It, that's fundamental. What we're saying is there's a whole other story out there, which is about knowing what you're truly good at, what, what your passions are, and really living those. Because it's when you're able to do this that you tap into the, 
the self-confidence, the optimism, and also the creativity and innovative thinking and curiosity. And so for most of us, this is somewhat of a blind spot. We may not even be aware of our character strengths, let alone give ourselves permission to use them. And, and it's such a great opportunity in terms of performance and just in terms of living your life in a more of a thriving kind of way. Second topic is health. So here we're not talking about sort of going to see my doctor type of health or a sort of nice to have health and wellness type of thing. Here we're talking about a much more fundamental link to how to deal with stress. And for a long time, uh, we've tended to demonize stress, saying that stress is a bad thing. Uh, we should be seeking to eliminate stress from our lives. Uh, but fundamentally, and that's why we have expressions like work-life balance, which tends to demonize work, saying that we need to recover from work by getting away from work. Uh, but whoever said that there aren't stressful moments in our non-work lives and whoever said there aren't moments of recovery and that are energizing at work. So we need a different framing here. And the point here is to say that in today's sort of unstructured world or increasingly unstructured world, the answer lies in actually owning the way you manage your energy level. So instead of taking your energy as a given, uh, maybe saying it's in my DNA or I'm just lucky because I'm energetic, saying, no, no, people who have more energy are like that because they do things to have more energy. And so the point here is to go from an external view of energy to more of an internal self-regulation view, both to be full of energy because it's when you have energy that you can actually embrace stress, but also, of course, uh, to prevent burnout, which has become such a challenge uh, in many of our today's working environments. The third uh, area we call absorption. Uh, and this has uh, to do with the fact that we lose so much of our productive time by being distracted. You know, how many hours of a day are spent in between different activities, staring at your to-do list, uh, thinking that you're multitasking? Well, oftentimes when you think you're multitasking, you're just flipping in between different tabs on your browser, waiting to get started. Uh, and so instead of multitasking, a lot of the time we're actually zero tasking. We're not really achieving anything. And there's a great opportunity to go from this sort of false multitasking to something that's much more powerful, which we can call, if you like, serial monotasking. And tap into pockets of productivity that you didn't know exist. So it's a great opportunity to actually have a more productive day. But also in terms of leadership, it's so fundamental in terms of listening. When you're absorbed, when somebody's talking with you, uh, that person can really feel that you're really with them. Uh, we've all, I think, been spoken to by somebody and sensed that their mind has sort of drifted off somewhere else. That's not a nice way to be led by somebody. So in terms of leadership, being absorbed is also a fundamental driver. The fourth area is relationships. So I guess this word is, is more straightforward. But what we're talking about here is, you know, in today's world where people are much freer to get up and walk if they don't like the look of you, the question is not, am I a leader or am I your leader? The question really should be, why would anybody want to be led by me? And when you ask the question this way, this raises a different type of set of questions, more along the lines of, how is it that I'm engaging so that people want to be led by me? And here there are a couple of factors that are really, really important, especially when you combine them together. So one is authenticity, just being yourself, being true to yourself. And the other is positivity, so showing the, 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 the caring, empathetic side of things. Now, a lot of people think that these two things cannot go together. In other words, I can be authentic and direct with you, but somehow it will kind of come out negative. Or others say, I can be really nice and empathetic, but I'll necessarily perhaps be holding something back. True leaders understand that you can and should do same, both at the same time. So you can be very direct with people and authentic, but in a caring, empathetic way. And the final area is, has to do with purpose. This is having a good answer to the why question. The sort of why am I doing this question? And not in terms of the meaning of life or the broader meaning of work, 
but rather meaning in my work day in, day out. In, in, in other words, when I come home from work every day and say, why did I do today's day of work? What kind of answers do I have? Do I have something better than I'm just doing this to pay the rent day in, day out? Now, there are many benefits to operating purposefully in terms of uh, zeal, enthusiasm, courage of your convictions, not taking no for an answer. But also, people who don't have purpose tend to get exhausted because they do too much. And why do they do too much? It's because they don't know what not to do because not being guided by their sense of purpose. So uh, this idea of when you operate from purpose, you can really declutter and be really focused is also a real benefit from operating purposefully. So what you have with this very rapid introduction is really, uh, I would say, an integration of 25 years of research that's gone into thriving and flourishing and, and peak performance. Uh, I wouldn't say that positive psychology as a branch of science invented this. I, I would say they codified some good philosophical practices that have maybe have existed for 5,000 years. So I think it's important to be humble about what we're talking about here, but at the same time to appreciate the scientific foundation that underlines it. So now we know this is the formula for peak performance. And the Potential Life program is going to give you a chance to get stuck into this in a meaningful way in your life. Now, you've all read, I think, the, um, the joy of leadership, so we won't dwell on that. Um, now, the important thing is to say, that's all very fine, saying that this is the formula, but I think a much more important question is, uh, what do we do about it? In other words, what's the answer to turning right, once we've understood what right actually looks like? So now, I just want to share a few words on the, the, the philosophy of the program. You know, what's, the, what's the change logic that's embedded within the program. And um, just want to share a very simple quote from uh, John Dryden, who was the, 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 the king's first ever poet laureate, I think in 1531. And at the time, this quote was a, a piece of poetry and also a piece of philosophy, if you like. Um, we first make our habits and then our habits make us. Well, it wasn't until quite recently that the, the true depth of this statement has been understood from a scientific point of view. Um, until about 20 years ago, uh, the neuroscientists were operating with a prevailing view that our brains were set from an early age uh, and we had personalities. Um, and it, it was only about 20 or so years ago that the instruments that allow us to see inside the brain in other words, I guess the microscopes actually allowed us to see what's actually going on in the brain. And what was discovered was something quite revolutionary, which is not that our brains are set, but rather our brains are changing all the time. So you have a representation like this, which is a neural pathway in the brain. And our brains change shape all the time. These neural pathways change shape all the time. And the way in which they change is when we repeat a behavior, those pathways, those that carry the electrical signals become deeper and more entrenched. And I think the appropriate uh, metaphor to think about here is imagine water running down a mountainside. After a while, that water is going to sort of uh, become streams, and then those streams will become gullies, and those the gullies will become more and more entrenched as time goes by. That's a pretty good metaphor for what happens with our brains. The question is, is it possible to, to make a different uh, gully actually happen in the mountainside? And the answer is yes. If you want to deviate the path of water, you can do. You can force a deviation. And to begin with, the water is probably going to splash a little bit haphazardly. Uh, but after a while, there'll be another stream that will form. And after a while, uh, that stream will become a gully and you'll have an alternative path at your disposal. So this is exactly how we need to be thinking about change. We need to be integrating the idea of small changes. So this is the idea of deviating the path uh, of repetition. So water continuing to flow until ultimately that new path becomes the preferred path or the preferred habit and the preferred behavior. 
Uh, and if any of you are uh, musicians, uh, you will probably uh, understand what it's like to have learned a piece of music and, and it just becomes second nature. You know, I remember when I was a, a teenager learning to play the guitar uh, and finding it extremely difficult, the sort of two hand coordination. I remember as a 15 year old in Liverpool telling myself, I'm never ever gonna be able to learn this. It's just too difficult. I just don't get it. I don't know how other people are able to do this. But then you practice a little bit and then you kind of give up and then pick it up again. And after a while, that very same piece of music, uh, not only can you do it, but it's easy. And not only is it easy, but you can't imagine how it was that you were never able to do it. So something that was impossible has become second nature. And that's just a very simple illustration of our neural pathways changing shape. Uh, and that's uh, very much what underpins the change philosophy uh, in our program. So let's talk specifically about how this works in practice now. So as you go through the program over uh, several months, you will basically, you'll be operating on a weekly cycle, what we call your weekly action cycle. And there are three parts to this. So let me sort of introduce this logic here. Um, the first thing to say is that you will be having lots of conversations uh, with, your, with your coaches around what's going on. The social side of change is fundamental. Um, so one way of viewing the Potential Life program is as a sequence of conversations where you reflect on and discuss the changes that you're making. But of course, conversation in and of itself is not enough. You can't just talk your way out of trouble here. You actually have to do stuff. Those conversations need to be fueled by something. And so each week you will be, and this is the do part on this page, you will be trying out a new behavior. We call these behavioral experiments or life acts. That's the important bit. This is where the rubber hits the road, where you just try stuff out. Because again, you can't think your way out of trouble. You have to do stuff. But of course, these behavioral experiments, they need to be fueled by something. We just can't invent them. So you have the discover part of the three, the three Ds. And this is the 30 minute online module where you'll be introduced to a little bit of uh, content. You'll be introduced to some personal diagnostic data. And during these 30 minutes, you're gonna craft your behavioral experiment for the week. So I'd view the 30 minute module less as some kind of learning module, but rather a I'm crafting my experiment module, which you then conduct over the course of the week. And then you'll have your chat uh, with your coach. So that's the weekly cycle. And we'll have a look at how that works in practice. Uh, if you're wondering what might be an example of a behavioral experiment here, um, let's just think of an example. So in, in one of the modules, we talk about positivity and authenticity, as we introduced previously. So let's say during the module, the diagnostic data tells you that you have a bit of a negativity bias in the way in which you engage with people. It's perfectly possible. And so how might you do a behavioral experiment that helps you with this? Well, the type of thing that you do would be to think of a work colleague with whom you have a tricky relationship that you're going to be meeting in the week ahead. And this is real. So you'll be thinking, who might that be? Well, okay, I guess it's, it's Dave. Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., we have a weekly meeting with Dave, and for whatever reason, it, it never seems to go right. So that'll be the, the moment of your experiment. It's that precise and that simple. And you'll try out a positivity technique during your weekly meeting with Dave. Now, this might work for you, or it might not work for you. Uh, the point being, you have to experiment to know. You can't just think your way to resolutions here. So this is the weekly cycle that you'll be doing. And what's going to happen is that every once in a while, you're going to have an aha moment. Uh, you're going to say, you know, that's exactly uh, a new habit I'm going to introduce in my life. That's been really helpful to me. And so you're gonna be able to build up your own personal register of changes over the duration of the program. Of course, this list starts off empty, 
but progressively you're going to be adding to this list uh, and you may end up with 10, 15, 25, 35 of such changes. Uh, and by the end of the program, you'll be able to say, this is my personal deliverable. This is what I take away with me, my life changes register. Uh, and coming back to the habit, a metaphor here, you know, the way we like to think about this is that we as human beings, in the same way that a computer has an operating system, we have an operating model. Uh, and our operating model is governed by a set of habits that we have that dictate hundreds and thousands of small daily behaviors. So what you're crafting is a revised version of the habits that make up your personal operating model. And that's really the, uh, if you like, the methodology of the program and the deliverable that you'll be crafting for yourself over the duration. So what I'd like to do now is maybe just quickly log it in and just give you a very rapid guided tour of the salient points of the platform. So let's do that now. Hopefully. So with a bit of luck, you're seeing three uh, green uh, circles on the page. Great. Um, so this is a demo user who's completed the program called Jan Jones, and we're just going to look back on Jan Jones's experience here. So let's start with the end in mind and actually go to this life changes register we talked about. So we're just going to look at Jan Jones's register. We're going to click on the right side here and you see a little tab there called My Life Changes. Uh, and what you see is a long list of um, changes here. Uh, uh, so let's just look at a couple of them uh, just to illustrate some of the things that you might be doing here. So at the top of this page, you see a thing here called Always Show Zest When Entering the Office in the Morning, Even When the Mood is Bad. Now, to you and me, that might sound a little bit odd. Um, and perhaps not particularly relevant. Well, that's fine because it's highly relevant to Jan. Uh, Jan uh, went through the Strengths Finder, uh, and one of his character strengths is zest, is this sort of energy for life. Um, the challenge for Jan, however, is that he's a bit of a moody person. So some days, uh, when he walks into the office in a bad mood, but combine that with zest, you have everybody in this open plan office just running away, scurrying into the corner saying, get me away from this person. This is not a nice person to be around. Which is a real shame because there are other times when Jan's in a great mood and he wanders in and he's telling joke and there's all his energetic zest. It's just this wonderfully positive thing for the overall team environment. So Jan has realized that he's got something a bit special here, but he needs to learn how to moderate more intelligently how he uses this. So this is quite a profound realization for him. What you have here is a little orange bar that starts on the left side called not started yet. And then you manually, as you feel that you're progressing, move this to the right side and, and the right uh, is, it's a habit. So that's quite a profound one for Jan. If we just look at one more, or the, the one that you see second down now, it says, close my laptop when people come over to ask a question. Now, at some levels, this sounds like a small and sort of banal thing to be doing. But it turns out for Jan, this is really, really important. Because Jan has realized that you know, when he's been away from the office for a few days and he comes back in, everybody wants to speak to him. Loads of questions for him. He's, he needs to answer lots of questions for people. But he's also struggling a bit because he's got, to, he's got to write this report and he's got to submit it. And so oftentimes he finds himself sitting in the office working on this report, but kind of fielding people's questions at the same time. And nobody's really happy because people can feel that he's not really giving them their, his attention. And he's not happy because he's not really progressing on this document. So he's in a state of sort of mindlessness and trying to field too many things at the same time. So he's realized that there's a much more productive way of doing this, which is to make, to split the day up into two parts. And to, when he's in the office, to close his laptop, which signals to the team that he's available for the team, and, and just be available and kind of work through all of the questions and be properly present for the team. Uh, and that way, everybody's happy and that, that part of the, the day is, is dealt with. And then he can go up and hide on the fifth floor, maybe hide in a cubicle and work on his document and get that done out of the way. So in a way, he's replaced 
one large space of mindlessness by two specific spaces of mindfulness, uh, which allow him to be much more productive, but also much more uh, effective in terms of the quality of his work. So for him, this was a, a very important example. And so this long list is simply his revised script. And all of these things will relate to some aspect of the SHARP module in, in the sense that they are fueled by different behavioral experiments and conversations that took place during those weekly cycles. So let's have a look at what goes on in these weekly cycles. So I'm just clicking here on the left side, you see three levels, each level, has a duration of about three months uh, and has 10 uh, modules in them. So I've just clicked on level one and we can see these 10 uh, modules here. And so what I'd like to do is just maybe zoom in onto one of these modules and just look at the sort of salient points of the module. Uh, I don't want us to be doing the program now instead of you doing it yourself, so I'll keep this just very short. Um, first thing to say is that the time it takes to complete the module is about 30 minutes. Um, this is module one. You'll see there are 10 steps. So these 10 steps will, will take you about 30 minutes. Each module always ends with this thing called life act. This is your behavioral experiment for the week. And it always has the same format. So you'll recognize this format. Each week you have a do part, a discuss part, and an observe part. These are small things to do. And you'll be crafting the content of these experiments over the course of the module. So Jan, on his do uh, exercise here, has written, have a team brainstorm on working with partner organizations. Now, that's relevant to Jan based on his character strengths of teamwork and creativity. Um, you will come up with your own versions of this, so don't be necessarily inspired by anything that's written by Jan here. Uh, so he'll be doing that. Uh, on the discuss thing, is actually quite interesting. So here we're in the module that relates to strengths. Uh, his strengths are teamwork, love of learning, creativity. Uh, and one of the things to do is just to have a conversation about these with somebody who knows you well, maybe a spouse or a buddy. Uh, uh, and, and just see when you hold up your three strengths, what do they say? Do they go, oh, yeah, those two, that's definitely you, but not so sure about the third one. Whatever it is that they say, it's really helpful input for you to think about this. And then the third is more of an ob observe yourself over the course of the week and each week that comes out a little bit differently. So this is, these three things describe how the, the rubber hits the road in terms of you actually trying to introduce some of these practices into your life. And of course, each module each week has a different theme to it. So the nature of these experiments will be different. So let's go back to this 30 minute module. You know, what's going on here in these 10 steps? Well, essentially there are two things going on here. There's some video content uh, and there's some diagnostic data. And it's a combination of those two that give you enough meat to play with in order to craft this uh, life act. Let's just have a quick look for 10 or 30 seconds or so at one of these videos. Um, the point here to say is that these videos are not lengthy PhD courses. Uh, they are deliberately message driven, fairly sort of short and sharp, designed to give you what you need in order to be moving forward rather than a deep exploration of the subject. So this first video is called, it's the abilities, not the disabilities that count. And here we talk about how we've been conditioned to focus on our weaknesses. Let's just take, let's just take a few seconds to look at this. session is about how focusing on your strengths can lead to greater levels of success and well-being. Peter Drucker, who's one of the most important management experts of the 20th century, wrote the following. One cannot build performance on weaknesses. Only when you operate from strengths can you achieve true excellence. It takes far more energy to improve from incompetence to mediocrity than to improve from first-rate performance to excellence. This message to focus on strengths is counterintuitive to many because most people instinctively believe that fixing our weaknesses, what we're not good at, is what leads to the greatest return. And this isn't just a little bit wrong, it's actually totally wrong. 
but it's not surprising that we make this mistake. So we'll pause there. Uh, so you get this idea that we're just drip feeding you a little bit of knowledge, so a little bit of food for thought. And then you have some, some data to play with. So by the way, we'll ask you to reflect. You know, for example, here we'll, talk, we'll ask you about your starting point. Now, a lot of people are a little bit skeptical about this whole strengths business. And so it's interesting for you just to have a chance to sort of flag, what do you think about this? Are you not convinced by the idea of focusing on strengths? Are you in the sort of category, I, I hear the message, but I'm not quite sure how to introduce it into my life? Or are you the, yeah, I'm actually pretty good at this, I, I'm on it. So you'll select which of these uh, options corresponds to you and you'll get some encouraging feedback, just essentially helping you to realize that you're, you're in the right place. Um, and then uh, you'll have, uh, you will have completed the VIA Strengths Finder and you will receive this feedback around what your, your, um, your VIA strengths are. Um, so in this case, uh, teamwork, love of learning and creativity. So this is the example of getting some data fed back to you. This module is around strengths, but if I just move to a different module now, just for a second, uh, you'll have things like an energy diagnostic in module three, where you have a spider chart that uh, will tell you, give you some information on what's your energy profile, again, to guide you as you think about how will I uh, craft my behavioral experiment for the week. So in summary, what you're seeing over the course of this module is this video content uh, and this diagnostic data that helps guide you to craft your behavioral experiment, which you then do in step number eight, um, which we don't need to look at in detail now. Um, and then uh, you create your life act. And I may have a, oh, that's all good. Yeah. So, so that's what's going on here. So um, just another thing, you may be wondering, so what's the link between my life changes registers and the weekly module? So as each new module begins each week, you'll have an, op an option in step number two, as you can see here, just to click on this thing here, which is called My Life Changes, and that's your chance to up update your Life Changes register should you need to. Now, there's one final thing I just want to introduce to you here. I've talked an awful lot about diagnostic data, uh, but I haven't really described where this data comes from. So I want to describe two types of data source. Um, the first type of data source are surveys that you will be com completing uh, during your weekly module. So you'll be completing some questionnaires uh, that will bring together your thinking and structure and feed it back to you. Uh, and so that's one way of uh, diagnosing on your behalf. The other thing we do is a thing called life mapping. Now, you may be familiar with the concept of life logging, which is essentially looking back on your day and breaking it up into blocks and then analyzing those blocks fairly tightly. And what's very interesting, if you just do this logging for a, a few days, you already start to have a gra very granular picture of how you live your life. So we're gonna be also uh, adopting this concept in a thing we call the life map. So the very first thing that you're gonna be doing uh, when you start the program, the first step of level one is called life map one. And you'll be doing uh, between four and seven days you will decide how many days you do of this life mapping. So it's embedded here inside the platform um, and uh, you will have essentially seven days worth of life logs at your disposal. These are 30 minute increments that you can fill out for yourself. You won't be leaving any gaps. You'll need to do a minimum of four days, which is already gives you enough to be playing with, but some people really like doing this, in which case you're very welcome to go and complete seven days. Uh, and basically, if we take this example here, uh, I'm clicking on day number four uh, at 2 p.m. There's an activity called work lunch with Dick. So this might have been one of your activities. Maybe it was a business lunch. Uh, and so we just look back on how you log this. First of all, you have to define what is the activity. So it has been defined as lunch with Dick. And then you have 10 questions on a one to five scale. And this is where the magic happens, is answering these questions, because these questions will feed the insights that we can then feed back to you as you do your weekly modules. So questions like, was I exercising a strength? One to five scale. Did I like or love this lunch with Dick? If I really loved it, I give myself a five. If I hated it, give myself a one. Um, was it energizing for me or draining for me? 
Was I physically active? How anxious or calm was I? If I was calm, it's a five. If I'm anxious, it's a one. So you take the scoring from the order of the words in the question. How bored or engaged was I? If I was bored, I was one. How negative or positive was I in this interaction? How authentic was I in this interaction? How meaningful was this activity to me? And how committed am I to this activity? Now, the first time you do these questions, they might find like uh, I have to really think about them a little bit, but I can promise you they become second nature very quickly. And so the way you'll be doing this is at the end of each day, you're going to be looking back on your day and filling out a day's worth of logging. If you want to do it two or three times in the day and look back on shorter blocks of your day, that's fine as well. Uh, my advice to you is not to wait until the next day to log what happened on what then would have been the previous day. Because at that point, your memory has already started to fade and a lot of the freshness of your emotions will have faded. So log within the same day. If you miss a day, that's fine. These, these days don't absolutely have to be uh, contiguous. You just need to get four good days worth of logging. Um, and I would also say, please really view this activity as an investment because all of the data that you'll be collecting will be drip fed back to you as you go through the modules. Let me just give you an example. What's my energy baseline here in module number three? You, you'll see graphs like this, time spent feeling energized at work and in non-work um, and the different activities in which I felt most energized. This has come straight from the life mapping. And so the more thought that you put into it, obviously the better data that will come out. So view this as a bit of a hump, a bit of an investment that will see, really set you on course uh, to, to get the most from these uh, weekly modules that you then go straight into once you've completed the, the, uh, the life mapping. So that's the essence of what the platform looks like. I'm going to switch this screen share off now uh, and maybe just sort of uh, open up for any questions to the group uh, and just see what your uh, reactions are at this stage. Yeah, look, um, Angus, I was just going to reiterate just what you said. I, it went the first round that I did this in terms of the life mapping. I, um, I stumbled uh, a bit in that I didn't keep up kind of the recording and if you try and look back uh, two days um, uh, uh, hence I think you lose it um, and it becomes rather bland and the um, uh, and the information's really not what it, what it should be. Yeah absolutely thanks thanks for underlining that this scientifically there's this thing called our, our experiencing self and our remembering self mm. and most surveys appeal to your remembering self so they say you know three weeks ago uh how you know what have you done over the last month or something like that now our remembering cells aren't very good um and so what this technology is trying to do is to tap much more closely into our experience self in other words our life as we actually experience it but for that to work obviously logging has to happen pretty close to the experience itself so uh, on the same day is just fine yeah Thank you. We've got a mobile, a mobile population. Uh, is there any preference of, of, of entering data or managing the system either on uh, a mobile phone or a tablet or a computer? It's, uh, I'm just experience which is the best mode or the preferred mode. Yeah, so, um, so the system has been designed for mobile. Uh, so if you log in from your mobile browser, so we're not talking about downloading an app here. There's no app to be downloaded. But if you just log in from your mobile browser, it works. It's designed for that. So it works perfectly well. Of course, it works perfectly well on your tablet and your laptop as well. Um, if I just describe what most people do, I think most people do the life mapping from their mobile device. It kind of feels like a mobile logging type of thing. Um, and then I think in terms of doing your weekly modules, I think you have a bit of a split. Uh, I think a lot of people like to find a quiet moment in the day to do this. And to be honest, we recommend that. That tends to take you more to your laptop and a larger screen, maybe in a quiet space. Uh, 
Uh, but some people have different lives. I mean, some people do this because they're on the bus going to work in the morning. Uh, and that's going to be more of a mobile thing. Uh, so, you know, we're, the flexibility is there. My advice would be when you're doing your, your weekly module, don't have a hard stop. Um, because if you do have a hard stop because there's, there's another meeting or another activity beginning, probably 10 minutes before the end of the module, you already need to start thinking about my next meeting. Uh, and that's just unfortunate and a risk of distraction. So if you can give yourself no hard stop at the end, uh, then you can just enjoy and be fully immersed in the module right to the end and then pick up the pieces and move on once you've fully completed. Thank you. Certainly, I, I found um, uh, previously finding that quiet time on the weekend that was a consistent time that sort of worked for me. and. And so I couldn't always do it at that time, but I knew that if I didn't, then I had to find some time during that day to get it done. And that, that worked really well. But I, I was going to ask too, can you share with us what are, in the, in the first um, uh, modules, what are some of the shifts that sometimes surprise people? Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, let's talk a bit about strengths. Uh, there's a reason why we start the program with strengths because of course, you know, we could have chosen a different order. Mm. Um, but there's something about strengths, which is a bit of a slow burn. And I would argue it's a lifelong journey actually. And so giving, starting with this so that people have more time on strengths to, to sort of percolate and reflect over the course of the program is really important. So as you do the strengths module, I encourage you not to view it like a dispensing machine where you stick in your, your quarter and you get a can of Coke out, but rather the beginning of a process where you're really reflecting on what are deep down my character strengths. And, and for some people, this is a bit disturbing, uh, especially if you haven't really done much of this type of thinking before. Some people might say, it feels a bit abstract. You know, you know one of my strengths is, is love. Um, as I think I've mentioned in a, in a previous meeting, you know, we, we were re recently working with the sales force and the, the, the head salesperson, the top character strength was love. Um, uh, and he thought this was absurd uh, until his fellow colleagues pointed out to him that one of the reasons why he's so good is that he really does remember his client's names and cares about and their kids and the fact that their grandmother was in hospital and all this kind of stuff. He really loves his clients. Whereas all of the other salespeople are writing this down, sticking it in the database and then kind of forgetting about it and having nothing like the same level of sort of presence for their clients. And so this is a very real example of where uh, that link was there. It just wasn't obvious to see it. And you needed some other people to just to shape the tree with you a little bit to see it. So that's how I'd characterize the sort of process a little bit on, on strengths. Um, on health, and on absorption, I think they tend to be more immediate. Now, the important thing on health here is not to say, I already knew this. We know that you already know a lot of this stuff. That's not the point. The point is, are you taking responsibility for your energy levels? And what more can you do? Because there are bound to be plenty of things that you can do more of, whether it's sleep, whether it's nutrition, whether it's some of the sneaky depleters in your life that drain your energy, maybe a few little unpleasant interactions that happen in the day that drain the energy from your body. We all have plenty of these. So what can we be doing to take our profile further forward on this one? Uh, and then on absorption or mindfulness, I think for a lot of people uh, in a lot of professional environments, they just feel as though they're underwater all the time with no remedy in sight. And I think for a lot of people, this is for the first time somebody showed them a light at the end of a tunnel here. There's something I can do to take back control, get my head above water and feel like I've got space, I've got oxygen in my life to be creative, uh, to recover, to rest, and at the same time be as productive, if not more productive. So that's some of the sort of things that sort of hit people as they, as they, as they start the program typically.